It's apparent from what was on the blackboard when I walked in that a midterm exam has been given in some course, and so I want to announce the midterm exam for this course, which is a take home, and I'm going to read the question so that those people who are not enrolled and never want to take an exam again <laughs> will know what they are missing. <clears throat> uh, one question. It says, in the preface to a book containing essays exploring ways in which singular hypothetical events, such as battles lost rather than won, successful rather than unsuccessful assassinations, etc., might have derailed the course of Western history, three distinguished historians conclude that prior to about A.D. 1500, it is easy to throttle the baby in its cradle. There seem to be innumerable possibilities for redirecting history so that the West never rises. Beyond this date, it becomes progressively more difficult to find single junctures at which it is plausible to suppose that, but for this, events would have led the world down a markedly different path. After 1800, it's virtually impossible to halt or reverse the rise of the West, although one can easily envisage it being either more benign or more malign. All right, that's the quote. Making use of material in the Earth and its peoples, Robert Marx, Origins of the Modern World, and the lectures in, the co in this course, write an essay discussing the notion of inevitability with respect to the seemingly dominant role of Europe in world history between 1500 and 1900. Questions you might address include, but are not limited to, the relative importance of political as opposed to economic history, the significance of quantitative measures of change, such as population size, production of particular goods, etc., the role of ideology and our religion and our philosophy, global differences in scientific outlook, technology, and access to resources, human factors such as social organization, class, education, and rural as opposed to urban life, military affairs, and chance. <laughs> yeah, okay. <clears throat> um, I showed this to a learning colleague in the department. <laughs> he read through and he said, wow, wow what an opportunity for bullshit. <laughs> um, and I was quite proud. I, I thought, well, you know, you can ask students to do various things in a course. Uh, one thing you would ask for them is to acquire a command of some uh, of some content so that you can ask them a question, uh, you know, what happened this time or who was so and so, and they'll be able to answer the question and be able to applaud them and say, oh, you are a very wise student because you have learned this content. Another way of looking at a course is to say that it is trying to encourage people uh, to, uh, to think of things. And that is what this course is about. Uh, basically, this is, um, this is a show-off course in public thinking on my part. And uh, I want to give you a chance to do your own thinking, although not in quite so public a form. <clears throat> Nevertheless, that being said, utter, utter bullshit uh, will not be encouraged. In other words, um, you know, simply to riff on the word inevitability Say, like, what is inevitable? What, what is not inevitable? You know, being is being. Everything surely is inevitable. It could not have been otherwise because it is the way it was. This is not what I'm looking for here. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm looking for here for some, some uh, specific arguments with respect to specifics of, of history and teaching uh, assistants who will grade the exams in the undergraduate um, sections are probably not nearly as tolerant of um, uh, idle vaporings as I might be. So, uh, so when you, I'll post this, uh, this question, I'll send it to everyone in an email so you get it uh, probably this later this evening or tomorrow and you will have until uh, November 10th to, uh, to compose your reply. The recommended length is um, 2,000 words. Okay. Now, uh, so much for the midterm. Uh, in the summer of 1960, I'm starting here with ancient history, um, I came home from college to discover to my 
horror that my mother had arranged for me to have a job for the summer. Uh, I was then and have always been really indisposed uh, toward work. Uh, it's the reason I'm a professor. And um, I discovered that I was going to have to work for the county surveyor in Winnebago County in northern Illinois. And <clears throat> he was in the process of having drawn a set of maps uh, under his supervision. And the maps would show all the property in the county. And somebody had to look at the tax records, which consisted of who was paying tax on a property, and compare the tax records with the, with the deeds to see who actually owned the property, make sure that the property described in the tax records uh, corresponded to, uh, to the description of the property as owned. And that might not seem terribly demanding, but the fact of the matter is, it meant that I spent an entire summer in, the, in a vault in the county recorder's office pulling down uh, metal-bound uh, volumes with copies of deeds and looking through them and uh, checking the data against other things. And of course, I blew off my job most of the day. Uh, I still got more done than anyone else had, who had been hired to do the job because they were blowing, blowing off the whole day. Um, uh, and I looked at a lot of deeds, the history of, of, the, of the county I was living in, the history of the city I was living in. And it was really quite fascinating because I'd look at the original plats and how uh, lots were laid out and how the streets were laid out. And I run across things like here's a person who owns a piece of property that's three inches wide and, you know, uh, 400 feet long and it's in the middle of a current, you know, public street and trying to figure out how in the world did that ever come about. Um, but one of the things that most interested me were the deeds from the uh, late 40s in particular, uh, maybe into the early 50s, but I think late 40s only, that uh, were, had restrictive covenants. They were deeds that said uh, that the person buying this property uh, agrees in the purchase of the property never to transfer this property uh, by sale to anyone of the, of the Negro, Jewish, Italian, Greek, or Polish races. Uh, there may have been more races than that, but I remember those five in particular. And ultimately, the Supreme Court struck down restrictive covenants, and they disappeared uh, from the deeds. This is a well-known episode in American history, and it uh, became, you know, the striking down of restrictive covenants was later uh, very important in the, uh, say, in the civil rights movement and the integration of, of neighborhoods. But what struck me was that uh, everyone knows that Jews and blacks were uh, discriminated against in housing. But they don't know that Italians and Greeks and Poles were. Of course, one might simply say uh, non-Protestants. But, uh, but it was interesting that all of them were called races. And the naming of races, um, or the naming of people whom you are um, engaged in some sort of exercise of dominance over. Because after all, a restrictive covenant is an exercise of dominance. You are, you are saying that people like me, the conveyor of the property, are the only people who can live this property. We will not allow uh, outsiders in. Um, and this naming of, of, uh, of others uh, is a very important aspect of colonial history. Um, it's a broader philosophical matter. In other words, uh, say, when you get into the arcane debates over animal rights, one of the things that you will often run into is uh, verse, um, uh, chapter 2, verse 20 of the, um, of the book of Genesis, where Adam names the animals. And that is meant to show that 
humans have uh, conferred by God dominance over the animals and that therefore the slaughter and eating of animals is uh, ordained by God because he has put the animals, all the animals, uh, the sea, the air, the land, uh, under the, uh, uh, under the um, uh, phenomenal, literally, the nominal control of, of Adam. And you get the same thing presented slightly differently in the Quran, where God presents to Adam the names of the animals, although he doesn't have the naming in pre precisely the same way. And the whole question of, of what naming means philosophically. After all, in naming the animals, this wasn't uh, naming, you know, okay, you are Duke and you're Rex and you're Fido, and, and this is not naming individual animals. It's naming species of animals, and that's, that's assumed because only humans have individual names in this construction of things. Other people have categorical names, just as uh, you know, you prohibit the Greeks from living in a neighborhood, but you don't specifically prohibit a series of Greek surnames. Um, my old college classmate Saul Kripke has made a major uh, philosophical school out of asking what is a name and how are names, what do names mean? And I've never understood anything he has written, but he's a very famous, supposedly one of the most important philosophers of the last 200 years. But the fact of the matter is that I became quite absorbed and have been for years in the issue of naming. And I've done, done this several times in this class. Uh, talked about um, research I've done on the nature of naming and the uh, things that can be read into naming. When it comes to uh, the chapter that we have for this week, which is uh, Africa, India, and British, the British colonial empire, uh, one of the things that is very important is the question of uh, identifying uh, the people over whom uh, colonial domination is, uh, is exercised. Um, this is not something that is particular uh, to the British, nor is it something that is particular to European colonialism. This is something that has been going on for hundreds if not thousands of years in which uh, assigning names, um, categories of people, uh, carries with it a, uh, an implication of, uh, of domination, particularly uh, when the names are, are uh, selected by the namer uh, or where you have a, a wide variety of possible names and the namer is simply selecting uh, a subset of those names to say these are the significant names. For example, uh, one of the most important intellectual figures in my area of study, uh, Islamic history, is Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun was a, a uh, someone of um, uh, Andalusian, uh, Tunisian uh, background and experience uh, with his cultural background primarily in Islamic Spain. He lived at the end of the 14th century. Uh, his book is um, the introduction to history, actually the introduction to his book, um, is, well, let's say Ibn Khaldun is the most, is the, the one Arab uh, name that generally intellectuals have heard of after Muhammad uh, and the most important Arab before Edward Said. Um, you know, there's no one in between who, uh, who is an Arab who commands uh, that kind of, uh, of attention. And I'm going to talk about Edward Said later in this lecture, so I'm, the reason I'm linking them here. So Ibn Khaldun has a theory of history that I will not go into. I've talked about it in another lecture. Um, but he also, uh, the, the big book um, that he has is on the history of the Berbers. Uh, or the Arabs and the Berbers. 
uh, the Berbers being the native population of North Africa, and he is an Arab. Kitab al Ibr fi Tarikh al Arab al Berber, the, uh, a book about the Arabs and the Berbers. The Berbers in his presentation are all descended from Goliath, uh, who it's rather surprising. We all thought he was dead. But it turns out that his family went off to North Africa uh, in this story and became uh, the progenitors of the native population of North Africa. So you have a, an origin uh, story of who the Berbers were. And, um, and then you, 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 you divide them into tribes, and you name the tribes. Now, prior to uh, the era, prior to Ibn Khaldun, really, or prior to, let's say, the earliest Arab sources dealing with North Africa, which go back to uh, the 900s, um, uh, there isn't any word Berber. Uh, there, there are people in North Africa, and in Latin and Greek, they had names as peoples. Um, those in Algeria were called Numidians. Uh, those in Morocco were called Mauritanians. Uh, those in Northwest Libya were called uh, Tripolitanians, or Northeast Libya were the Cyrenaicans. Southern Libya were the, uh, uh, the uh, Garamantes. Um, and there are, there are a lot of names, and we think of them as sometimes tribal names, something like that. But the word Berber doesn't occur. Uh, a remarkably um, astute Algerian historian who teaches at University of Southern California, Ramsey Ruigi, maintains that Ibn Khaldun invented the Berbers, and that he invented the Berbers in exactly the same way that, uh, according to Edward Said, Europeans invented the, invented the Orientals, invented the Orient that it was an exercise of, uh, of establishing a type of dominance. That they basically the, the invention, the, the creation of, a, uh, of a, a word that would encompass all the native North Africans um, corresponded to the idea that those people coming from Spain or from Syria, they were Arabs. And they weren't going to mix the Arabs up and the Berbers. The Berbers had their history, the Arabs had their history. I, this may seem self-evident, except that by the time he was writing, a very large proportion of those people he's calling Berbers spoke Arabic, uh, rather than Berber or in addition to Berber. In other words, the distinction uh, between Arab and Berber was not the clear-cut one that's implied by this, uh, by this uh, invented genealogy. Uh, we usually think that the word Berber uh, relates to barbarian and that it comes from a Greek background that barbarians were people whose speech was characterized by being bar, 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 bar. So they were the barbaroi, the people who said bar, bar. And the repetition of the syllables is important because the characteristic of animal sounds in most languages is repetition. So you say, um, you know, moo moo or ba ba, or something like that, arf arf, uh, and you know these people who were not Greeks were people who went bar bar because they were basically animals. So by this construction of it, um, Berber should have been a pre-existing word used by Greeks and Romans for the North Africans because they certainly were not speaking. Uh, and in their homes, uh, the Greek and Latin uh, languages. They were going bar bar, bar bar bar, whatever the, you know, what barbarians do. But the fact of the matter is that there's no Greek or Latin text that actually uses the word. Um, so it's an invented word. Uh, probably, it seems that the earlier use of the word is associated mostly with a seaport in Sudan uh, still known as Berbera, uh, that seems to be the only uh, use of the word prior to Ibn Khaldun, uh, or Ibn Khaldun's sort of um, uh, codification of things. There, it is used by some earlier Arab sources, 
Um, and they do not use the tribal names of the Roman period. In other words, the Romans have a list of tribes, and none of those tribes show up in the Arabic sources. So it, it's a puzzling sort of thing, but what Ruigi argues is that Arabs from Spain, as the Christians are reconquering Spain, uh, they came to North Africa as a more sophisticated, more cultured, at least in their own minds, uh, more literate, dominant elite, and they needed a way of uh, representing uh, the indigenous population um, because in that representation they would be the superior, uh, the superior group. Now interestingly this was picked up by the French uh, after 1840 when they conquered uh, Algeria and they started to make a, uh, they said well we must distinguish uh, distinguish between Arabs and Berbers but for the French, unlike for Ibn Khaldun, uh, the Berbers were superior to the Arabs because French scholars uh, who were specialists on native population in North Africa in the early 19th century and even more as you went further into the 19th century uh, believed that before Islam, the native population of North Africa uh, was Christian and that they were basically still kind of latently Christian. Um, and by being, if they ever had been, many of them were Christian, there's no question about that. But the idea that having been Christian in your family, um, what, uh, 1,200 years earlier, meant that you were more susceptible to becoming civilized in the 19th century in the French fashion it seems like a bit of a stretch, particularly when it relies on evidence such as um, the design of camel saddles. So you have a uh, particularly Berber camel saddle, and it, and the front of it is like that. It's like they're sort of like handlebars, but people say, "Oh, it's a cross." You know, they still have the cross. They still worship the cross. They're still latently. Christians, and so the Arabs come to be represented as, uh, as Muslims, that is to say as barbarians for the French, uh, and the Berbers as a sort of a primitive but potentially democratic and Christian population that the French could feel better about, so that when the French were thinking in the 1850s or so about creating, uh, using the wonderful American example, creating Arab reservations where they would herd the Arabs onto the most desolate land the way we in this country herded Native Americans onto the most desolate lands. Uh, they never did create Arab reservations, but they certainly thought about it. They thought that was a cool idea. Um, then the French could occupy the, uh, you know, the better land that the Arabs had been <coughs> occupying, but not really benefiting in the way the French could. But the Berbers were not to be included. The, Ber the Berbers were to be sort of singled out for a special favor. The result is that today uh, politics in Algeria is very strongly inflected along lines of Arab versus Berber. So that um, you had one colonialism that goes back to the uh, 14th century uh, that is saying Berbers and Arabs are different. You have a second colonialism that goes to the 19th century that says Berbers and Arabs are different, even though the vector of difference is uh, reversed, uh, goes from Arab superiority to Berber superiority. Uh, and in both cases, it uh, it's, appears to be a, an intellectual creation of the uh, dominating group and, uh, and yet it takes on a reality. So you can see why this would apply to India in the 19th century. Okay, maybe you can't <laughs> um, because it's a very obscure connection perhaps, but it relates in, the, in British India to the question of caste uh, and to the question of whether uh, 
what happened in India was the same thing that happened with the French and before them with the Andalusian Arabs in Algeria. That is to say, um, uh, labels uh, that, that existed, or at least to a substantial degree, came to be selected as significant names. And then you had a reification uh, of division signified by names that, um, that was quite different from the pre-existing division, division of the population. Uh, the, the notion that caste is a, uh, you know, not a creation of the British, but rather that uh, it is something that receives its peculiar uh, significance during the period of British occupation in India, um, has been brought out most <coughs> most uh, explicitly by the uh, vice president for um, academic affairs and dean of the faculty of Columbia University, Nicholas Dirks, in a book called Casts of Mine. And in that book, uh, Dirks argues that when the English came to India <coughs> in the uh, 18th century, became uh, dominant in one area after another as agents of the East India Company, uh, that they really weren't very, they didn't talk about caste in particular. Uh, they looked at a finer grain sort of thing, like who is, who is ruling here, who's in the army, who is, what's this village like, what is the production like here. <clears throat> you go back to the 18th century descriptions of India and uh, religious difference uh, doesn't appear to be uh, the, the most significant way of describing the population. Um, but by the uh, second half of the 1800s, you have encyclopedic collections to identify and name every caste. And this gets reified into uh, the first census of British India in 1872, and the census proceeds to identify people by caste uh, for the next um, 60 or 70 years. Uh, caste uh, was a, uh, not an invention, uh, nobody denies that you had certain religious groups that could be identified by their occupation or by endogamy, but they weren't necessarily, or in, indeed they weren't in all likelihood, the, uh, the strongest uh, divisions of the society in every area. But once you had decided that all Indians belong to a caste, except those who are outcasts, who, who, are, uh, uh, who are defined as in a lower order, or who are Muslims, who are not supposedly part of the caste system. Um, then you had a means not only of, of um, dividing and classifying the population, but also a means of arguing that this population can't really by itself constitute a modern society because caste created this way as with the Berbers whom Ibn Khaldun traced back to Goliath, uh, caste is seen as primordial. It's part of the first order of humanity. That's what primordial means. Um, so it becomes something that can be studied. Uh, the primary source that people would go to for the start of this is in the Rig Veda, uh, in um, book 10 of the Rig Veda, um, hymn number 90. It's a hymn known as the Purusha Sukta, and it's about 
a being named Purusha. Actually, it should be, it's just an S with a dot under it, so that the Sanskritist among you do not get offended. But it's pronounced Purusha. Uh, a thousand heads hath Purusha, a thousand eyes, a thousand feet. On every side pervading earth, he fills a space ten fingers wide. This Purusha is all that yet hath been and all that is to be, the Lord of immortality. <coughs> when the gods pre prepared the sacrifice with Purusha as their offering, its oil was spring, the holy gift was autumn, the summer was the wood, they balmed as victim on the grass. <coughs> Purusha, born in earliest time. With him, the deities and all sadhus and urshis sacrificed. <coughs> so what we have here is the idea that you have a primordial being, Purusha, and that being is sacrificed um, on an altar uh, or at an altar by the gods themselves. Okay. From that general sacrifice, the dripping fat was gathered up. He formed the creatures of the air and animals both wild and tame. From it were, were horses born, from it all cattle with two rows of teeth, from it were generated kine, from it the goats and sheep were born. When they divided Purusha, how many portions did they make? What do they call his mouth, his arms? What do they call his thighs and feet? The Brahman, and to say the priest, was his mouth. Of both his arms were the Rajanya made. These are the warriors, the Kshatriyas. His thighs became the Vaishyas. His from his feet, the Shudra was produced. These are the four uh, orders of society, the parent structure from which the castes are thought to derive. Each one is made from a different part of Purusha. Uh, these four orders are called Varnas, a uh, word that means color. The moon was gendered from his mind from his eye, the sun had birth. Indra and Agni from his mouth were born. Those are two gods. Uh, um, and Vayu from his breath. Vayu is the god of the wind. Forth from his navel came midair. The sky was fashioned from his head, earth from his feet, and from his car, the regions. Thus they formed the worlds. So Purusha is the source of creation. This is the great creation myth of the, uh, of the Vedic tradition. It is, uh, obviously has some parallel with the Adam myth. Uh, that is to say, the animals are not here named by Purusha, but rather they're actually part of Purusha. But more important from, an, from the point of view of people trying to think structurally about India, we would now call it structurally, but uh, you know, think generally would probably be a better term for the 19th century. Uh, more important was the idea that the groups of people were defined by being made for up from parts of Purusha. Then within each varna, you had, you had castes. Uh, the word jati is the closest uh, we have in English to the word uh, cast in this smaller sense, although often when you read descriptions of caste, they will lump the Varnas and the Jatis uh, together. The word caste itself was a Portuguese term. I mentioned it uh, in talking about the New World, how uh, mixed race people um, in the uh, New World um, form different castes. So uh, by this construction of things, there's a primordial division of the Indian population into uh, groups that are defined by occupation, are defined by costume, are defined by marriage practices, 
and normally endogamy. Uh, and they're defined by um, uh, taboo relationships having to do with who is permitted to eat with whom, who is permitted to touch uh, somebody, who is permitted to, uh, to prepare food. Uh, and these uh, castes are seen as the primordial structure of India and taken together they constitute Hinduism. Yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> when you go into, say, earlier uh, pre-British texts, say L.B. Rooney's book on India, a famous uh, Muslim scholar, the Varnas may be described, but the the idea that every Indian belongs to a specific unalter, unalter, unalterable group isn't there. And in fact, you have many more divisions that, uh, that we might describe as divisions of tribe or divisions of, um, of uh, status or power or something like that. It's not just a, a congeries of tribe, of uh, castes that make up India. So you might say, well, um, the people who, who described the caste system were obviously uh, people who were um, consumed with thoughts of uh, a religious textual, uh, a re of textually conveyed uh, religious differences. Differences that were recognized by Indian scholars and were picked up and made a cornerstone of British, uh, of British control of the population um, uh, by intellectuals, administrators working for the British administration in India. In that sense, people have argued that caste was invented by the British. This doesn't mean that there were not divisions that come to be labeled uh, uh, in this rather rigid structure as being caste differences, nor does it mean that all those uh, labels were truly as they later come to be described. But you can say that, uh, if you follow this line of argument, that the British invented caste and that they invented caste in order to uh, to to dominate the native population of India. Uh, they dominated them politically, economically, militarily, um, but now they're dominating them in a sense um, uh, culturally by saying that their organization of society has been unchanging for 2,000 years and therefore the modernization of the society depends upon uh, getting rid or overcoming or going beyond the divisions of caste because the Indians really can't do that by themselves because they are locked into this, uh, this primordial uh, system of divisions. Now this kind of thinking uh, in which you, you say that the colonial power um, invents or selectively deploys names of things, uh, names for groups of people uh, for the purpose of dominating them or ascribes uh, intrinsic status to certain groups, for example, groups considered like warlike tribes or peoples and others considered not warlike. Uh, this sort of thing is part and parcel of uh, what we now think of as post-colonial thinking. That is to say, uh, those people who uh, come from or are deeply involved intellectually with societies that were under colonial rule for throughout the 19th century in particular <coughs> um, are uh, very much interested in reassessing 
what that colonialism actually did. And that reassessment is, is very important. Uh, when I came to Columbia, the person into whose office I moved was a very distinguished um, uh, Christian Arab uh, economic historian named Charles E. Sowey. Very highly respected. Everyone always liked Charles, a very witty man. Uh, but when he taught economic history, he was interested in, in drawing up a balance sheet. You know, colonialism, good or bad? You know, let's measure the number of miles of railroad or increase in productivity or uh, investment on the part of the colonial power uh, in ways that did not necessarily repay the colonial power. And he would generally come to the conclusion that, you know, on balance, colonialism was probably okay and maybe even pretty good that these countries, whether they were in the Middle East, which was his most, most of his concern, he wrote about Turkey and the Arab world and Iran, or whether it was farther afield in India, uh, people of his turn of mind were saying that the way you should appraise uh, the colonial era um, is sort of objectively in terms of uh, the, the outcome. Was it beneficial or was it not beneficial? And he would say as an economist uh, that, you know, on balance, uh, it was pretty beneficial. Okay, what the, uh, the alternative view um, really looked at the question of, well, beneficial for whom, and who is being left out of that, uh, of, of that, uh, of that party, of that, the people who enjoy some sort of benefit. In India, uh, this inquiry, which began in India more than any other place, uh, took the form of a school of thought known as uh, the subaltern school. Uh, uh, the subaltern uh, theorists uh, took their term subaltern uh, from the writings of uh, an Italian uh, Marxist named Antonio Gramsci. Uh, Gramsci was a uh, influential, very influential uh, Marxist historian who some of his most important works were the things he wrote when he was in prison in fascist Italy. Um, wrote in the 1920s, early 1930s. His um, he and a number of other Marxist writers of that time were strongly um, uh, interested in the fact that there had not been a communist revolution in Germany or other uh, developed countries. You know, the, it was fine. There was a communist revolution in Russia, but why Russia was a primitive country by comparison with Germany or France or Italy and the stresses of bourgeois society should have been uh, more evident in these other countries, and yet uh, no revolution. So they got involved, and particularly uh, members of this group uh, worked in, uh, in Frankfurt in Germany. They're often called the Frankfurt School, and Gramsci is derivative from the Frank Frankfurt School in, in, the, in this respect. Uh, they had the idea that the way bourgeois society works is not simply through uh, owning the means of production and uh, grinding the faces of the poor in factory labor, causing the poor to, to rebel, but rather they exercise a kind of um, intellectual hegemony. And hegemony is the key word for uh, Gramsci. Uh, they exercise a hegemony that comes from their ownership of or dominance of the, the intellectual discourse of the society. 
They're the ones who write the books. They're the ones who, uh, who produce the popular culture. They're the ones who, uh, who um, sort of assess what, what is a value or not a value in a society. And th through this domination, through this intellectual hegemony or cultural hegemony, it would be more broad, <coughs> they lure the oppressed population into concurring with the oppressors. You know, um, people lose sight of their objective interest and say, you know, it'd really be better if millionaires got a big tax break because even though I'm unemployed, uh, you know, one day I might be a millionaire, right? Uh, that's part of the uh, uh, of the view, and and that through this, uh, through uh, adroit compromises made with labor unions, in which they're given sort of half a loaf, uh, and through their assignment of the scale of values, they delude the oppressed population into seeing things in their fashion. All right, it, there's a, a tremendous amount of literature on this um, that goes down to all sorts of things like, you know, pop music as the opiate of the masses and things like that. Uh, but when it comes to, to the colonial arena, which Gramsci did not write about, and in general, uh, it, it's, it's, um, uh, it, was a, it was an area that the Marxists were um, were not terribly well equipped to deal with theoretically. Um, but in the colonial area, the idea arose <coughs> that the, um, the domination that uh, Gramsci identified as cultural hegemony in the European context was being carried out by people who uh, who come to be labeled as Orientalists. And here we get to Edward Said. In 1978, Edward Said, uh, uh, who taught English here at Columbia, um, wrote a book called Orientalism. Very much uh, derivative in its notion of hegemony from, uh, from the work of uh, Gramsci. <clears throat> and from the work of uh, a French thinker, Foucault, who has, uh, whose notion of hegemony was focused on the way in which the Enlightenment uh, has deceived us all into thinking that uh, the values of the Enlightenment are actually good when actually they suck. Um, so what Said was looking at were theorists who said that the writers, the thinkers, the people who produce the books are not simply isolated in an ivory tower, <clears throat> but rather they are the instruments of a very powerful um, uh, mechanism that is designed to create uh, systems of, of domination. Uh, systems of domination in Europe would include the, uh, you know, the persistence of uh, of bourgeois capitalism, or the uh, uh, persistence of Enlightenment-based pseudo scientific rationality that defines things like uh, uh, sexual orientation, or okay, you flunk your midterm, Howard. It's, uh, <laughs> you didn't turn off your machine. Um, uh, so this domination you know, takes certain forms in Europe. And what Said did, and it was really quite a, uh, a brilliant move, was to say that this notion of hegemony is um, carried out in the colonial arena, specifically the part of the colonial arena he knew something about, namely the Middle East or the Arab world, is carried out through the, uh, through the works of scholars who write uh, interpretive uh, studies that are designed to show that the people living 
under the colonial domination of, say, the French and the British in the Middle East are, in fact, um, uh, living in a unchanging primordial uh, system that is incapable of modernizing or changing in a progressive fashion. In the same way that caste uh, in India gets portrayed as this sort of uh, primordial um, uh, template that <clears throat> prevents the Indians from changing in a positive uh, in a positive direction, uh, therefore making it necessary for the colonial overlords to be the agents of lifting up the local peoples, lifting them out of their, uh, out of their primordial swamp and leading them into a better day. Um, so in other words, the thinkers who wrote about these areas uh, in, uh, in Saeed's construction of things uh, were collaborators in the domination of, of the Orient. The word he chose to use, uh, Orientalist, uh, Orientalism, was a pre-existing word. It had been used uh, throughout the 19th century uh, it had been embodied in a number of organizations, such as the American Oriental Society. Um, the notion of being an Orientalist was, up until Said, uh, looked upon as a, as a worthy calling. Um, there were, uh, if you looked into the antecedents of Orientalism, and you looked at how did they study these areas that were colonial areas. And you asked, did they study them uh, with imperialism in mind? Was that, was that their goal? In a few cases, it can be argued that, well, yes, they were working for um, uh, the Dutch or the French or the English imperial authorities. But in most cases, <coughs> they were just professors. Um, or, in Said's rather expansive definition of Orientalism, they were tourists, people who went to Egypt or Tunisia to paint pictures or write travel logs or write novels, and that all of their writing, all of their portrayals, the photographs they took, the paintings that they came home with, um, contributed to the construction of an image of the Orient as being um, uh, backward, um, uh, weak, slothful, um, on the one hand overly puritanical, but on the other hand overly obsessed with sexuality, uh, and so forth and so on. And also they dressed funny. Uh, so Said had a, uh, in the people he talked about, the scholars and the tourists, uh, it was rather different from the people whom Nick Dirks talks about who were, ta who were dealing with caste in India. There, very explicitly, the scholars who are involved are scholars who are contributing to the administration of British India. They're working for the British if they are compiling <clears throat> census records based on caste, or they're writing a dictionary, of, uh, an encyclopedia of caste, something like that. They are part of the, of the administration. Um, the subaltern school that looked upon uh, this kind of concern with caste and with fixed categories, names, that were assigned by the British administrators uh, and tried to speak on behalf of the, of the uh, people who were being ignored uh, in the historical records. And there's some brilliant uh, small-scale studies by subaltern historians to show how simply the way a British administrator describe a riot or describe a, an incident in some area 
would be distorted by, the, by literally by the categories that, that he had to, to deploy. And that if you found other sources, you would find that it was, it was different uh, from that. In other words, say something that uh, I mentioned before, the, uh, uh, the perusal of uh, the police interrogations in the Eight Trigrams Rebellion in Qing China at the same time, and how um, a rebellion that might have been simply portrayed as an assassination attempt against the emperor, once you actually got the raw police material, uh, turns into a very, very different type of extremely wide-ranging popular um, uh, sentiment based upon Buddhist messianism. Uh, the subalterns were trying to find, is it, can, can we find instances where we can hear the actual voices of the people as opposed to reading the British accounts uh, filtered through the pre-existing British uh, conceptions of what is important and what is unimportant. But when it came to Said working on the Middle East, uh, the fact of the matter is that most of the Middle East was not occupied by the French and the British until uh, after World War I. Um, Egypt was occupied in 1880. And uh, he doesn't make much of much a distinction between North Africa, which was occupied uh, from 1840 and on in Algeria, and the Middle East, which remains uh, farther afield from this. What, what he does in creating the notion of, of an intellectual establishment that, uh, that achieves um, on behalf of a dominant imperialist power, a type of cultural hegemony, <clears throat> what he does is create the general category within which the subaltern school finds a place. The subaltern historians were all Indians, virtually, and they wrote only about India. And the whole term, uh, the term subaltern did not spread. You did not have subaltern studies dealing with, oh, South Africa or Senegal or something like that. But Orientalism, by saying that the intellectual construction uh, of hegemony is not something specific to British records in a particular colony, but is part of a general uh, phenomenon, uh, which comes to be called Orientalism, um, uh, in Saeed's label, uh, the, it becomes a general category by which you can then say that the entire European colonial enterprise, not simply in India, and not simply in, um, in the Middle East, but the entire, British, uh, the entire European colonial enterprise, British, French, Italian, what have you, <coughs> is um, structured by intellectual, um, intellectual models uh, created by people whom we, whom we are pleased to identify as scholars, but who are, in a broader sense, uh, agents of, uh, of cultural domination. <clears throat> in the same way, for example, that a, uh, a scholar or a, uh, someone in Europe who was suggesting some way in which a labor union might be accommodated within a, uh, a capitalist structure in a way that would satisfy the demands of labor unions in part might be seen as, a, uh, as an agent of this sort of hegemonic um, uh, activity, cultural hegemony. <clears throat> then there is a question of could these people, painters, writers, novelists, tourists, scholars, um, could they be agents of imperialism um, without knowing it? And this has become a very important issue uh, today. Um, <clears throat> in its more um, raw uh, uh, formulation, uh, it is argued that if you are if you grow up in, a, in an imperialist environment as part of the dominant population in that environment, uh, then whatever you do with respect to 
people who are dominated in the colonial arena or even closer to home. Whatever you do is, is uh, unconsciously structured by the patterns of, uh, of privilege and, uh, you know, uh, dismissal that you grew up with. Um, at this point, we edge rather close to the idea that the only people <coughs> who can write about a subject are people who are, uh, who are native uh, to the population about which um, the writing is being done. Because if they are uh, people who come from a Euro-American background, particularly of um, older white male description, um, of which I'm one, uh, then they are agents of imperialism, whether they want to or not, because they grew up in a society of, uh, of domination, and therefore their, their intellectual output is going to be uh, uh, constrained within this unconsciously absorbed model of um, uh, privilege and, uh, and, and domination. Um, this has been very, very troubling in certain areas of academia, particularly, say, in the field of anthropology. Anthropology was pretty much defined by the idea that, you know, someone from you know, somewhere in Europe or America would go off to a foreign place and through participant observation uh, be able to describe, uh, to write an ethnography, to write a description of what that, what those people were like, <coughs> how they behaved, what was important about them. Uh, th this, uh, the Orientalist frame of mind begins to suggest that um, the very notion that one of these outsiders would go someplace and be able actually to, to perceive what, what was in the nature of the, uh, of the people whom they were visiting, that that was an illusion. And that, in fact, it was a, uh, contributed to, uh, to domination. So some of the most prominent uh, anthropologists uh, come to be thought of um, by a later generation as uh, agents of colonial oppression. Um, you know, Evans Pritchard, for example, who emphasized a kinship structure and uh, as applied to certain parts of the Arab world. <coughs> um, it began to be, the question began to be asked, um, you know, can you, you know, can a, a non-member of a group ever describe a group without uh, that he that he or she does not belong to, without being um, controlled by this cultural background. Um, are we? Go there was a point in Columbia's checkered history of anthropology when I chaired the anthropology department, because it was felt that the anthropology department was populated by people who were so immature that they could not be trusted to run their own affairs. And so it was put in receivership and I was put in as chairman and um, I put a big portrait of Khomeini over my desk and said I was gonna run it as a dictatorship. And I canceled all faculty meetings. I said, if the faculty can't get along, well, we just won't have any faculty meetings. Well, they have a meeting when there's something I, we need to have a vote on and I will summon the faculty to vote in favor of my proposal but otherwise we'd have no faculty. It worked pretty well. <clears throat> they didn't get along with one another and not seeing one another helped. And then they could blame all the, all the failures on me. But uh, one thing I discovered for a professor who came up for tenure at that time was that this was a professor who, who wrote about uh, America. And 
she was an American. Uh, she wrote a book about downward mobility in America. And one of the people who wrote on her, uh, who wrote you know, about her tenure situation, said, um, this person can't be an anthropologist because anthropology is defined as writing about other people. You can't be an American and do anthropology writing about Americans. And so then, we, of course, we had a big quarrel over that. Uh, she did get tenure. She went to another university, became a, a very distinguished career. Um, but, uh, but at that point, we were getting that division between a, an old school of anthropology uh, that said that difference between the observer and the other, the observed, is a crucial thing to a new uh, phase that said all those old anthropologists distorted everything because they didn't really understand, because they couldn't understand. They were part of the structure of domination. They were not, uh, not able to, to, to see things the way they would be seen from the inside. Uh, anthropology changed. Um, uh, a lot of this new thinking came into uh, comparative literature, came into history, political science. I won't, not so much political science. They're still kind of Neanderthal. But, um, <laughs> but, but this was a, a, a real turning point. It, <clears throat> it would not have occurred if Edward Said's work had not coincided with thinking that was going on elsewhere, particularly among uh, these historians in India who were giving fine-grained uh, studies of the distortions that colonial thinking and colonial administration produced in the written record, as opposed to Said, who is primarily interested in what Europeans had to say about areas where, in fact, um, fine-grained studies of colonial uh, domination were, were not exactly non-existent, but they certainly were no, nowhere near as important as, uh, as they came to be in, uh, as they were in India. Uh, those that did exist were primarily from uh, Egypt and Algeria, but he concentrates more on Egypt than on Algeria. <clears throat> so what we had was a, um, a big change in how one thinks in the academic world about uh, non-Euro-American parts of the world, or uh, more broadly about people who are not part of the, um, uh, the white dominant uh, population groups in, in Europe and America. Um, this gets associated with multiculturalism and a domestic, in a domestic arena, but um, these things are all rather uh, interrelated. Uh, so much of what has happened uh, in the 80s and 90s and since in terms of studying these, uh, these non-Euro-American populations in other parts of the world. Uh, so much of it has been de devoted to going back and reconsidering and uh, disproving or uh, undermining or disowning the scholarship of the last 200 years. Uh, that one of, the, uh, one of the unforeseen consequences of this concern for Orientalism and it, in the very broadest sense of the word, is a lessening of uh, actual, um, let's call it empirical scholarship, actual accumulation of new information on some subject or other. Uh, because if you're, if you're simply uh, reading archives or uh, reading uh, pre-modern text or something like that um, and producing some kind of study, uh, there's always a question of are you unconsciously uh, being an agent of uh, 
of American uh, you know, neo-imperialism. Uh, I could go into detail about how this has affected Colombia, uh, particularly the removal of three regional institutes after 50 years of existence from the School of International and Public Affairs because of faculty who do not believe that the study of international affairs should include the, the study of non-Western parts of the world uh, because if Columbia studies non-Western parts of the world, we will be party uh, consciously or unconsciously to American imperialism in those areas. I happen to strongly disagree with that, um, that construction of things, but it is um, gospel truth in the eyes of many of my colleagues. On the other hand, I'm a very old person, and um, <clears throat> I recognize that things change with uh, changing generation. Uh, I'll be 71 uh, next uh, Sunday, and perhaps I'm more aware of the um, divergence between my generation and uh, colleagues who are uh, 10 to 20 years younger than I was even last week. But, <clears throat> but when it comes to, to a chapter like this, um, this chapter is, is it's a good chapter. It tells you a lot of interesting things. Uh, there are no big errors in it. On the other hand, it's very old-fashioned. It does not, it sees it almost in the way that that economic historian saw it, of you know, what was good, what was bad, who was oppressed, who, uh, who benefited. Um, uh, it's the story that we have inherited from the last generation or two of people writing about how Europe encountered uh, the rest of the world in the era of imperialism. Um, but what I've been, the reason I decided to focus on this today is because just to make you aware that um, in another uh, 20 years, uh, this kind of chapter will be very different. That is to say, as the current uh, intellectual trends deriving from the subaltern school and from the broad uh, impact of the notion of Orientalism. As this percolates down from the, uh, from the professoriate into the level of textbooks, uh, we're going to see a very different portrayal of uh, how um, how and why the British Empire existed. It's very hard to imagine exactly what it will be like, but it will be, uh, I think, dramatically different. Um, I say it's very difficult to think how it will be like because uh, this is 25 after 5, and I don't have to think about what it will be like until Thursday, uh, but given two days, who knows what will happen. <laughs>